Welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. My name is Adam and I'll be your moderator. We're joined by Dr. Karen Halpern and she'll review Densplice Serona's Serac to Sarah block and how it's enhancing the possibilities of same day dentistry with its fast firing capabilities. If you have any questions, please add them to the Q&A section and we'll reply via email within two business days. Henry Shine is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation, live or on demand. And tonight's webinar is sponsored by Densplice Serona. Dr. Halpern, welcome. Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining me today. And special thanks to Henry Schein for sponsoring this webinar. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to spend the next hour or so with you speaking about one of the newer CAD CAM blocks that many of you may not know much about yet, Seric to Sarah. So to Sarah is an advanced lithium silicate block. It was released last March by Densply Serona. And quickly, it's become one of my new favorite blocks. So Tessera is a two-part crystal composition embedded in a glassy zirconia matrix. So the first part is a lithium desilicate, which it's a glass ceramic composed of lithium silicone and other crystal elements. And then we have virgilite, which is this special version of lithium aluminum silicate and new crystals grow as a result of firing. So it gains strength from firing. So why to Sarah? So currently it's the highest strength glass ceramic that we have available in our CAD CAM materials. And it's about 700 megapascals. What's nice about it is that the shade of the block already matches the shade of the final restoration. So this eliminates a lot of guesswork in our shade matching process. It happens to be very aesthetic and very lifelike. And now we have the ability to do a super fast processing in the speed fire furnace, it's only four and a half minutes to fire it. What's also a nice feature is that we have the opportunity to either cement or bond it. So that's very dentist friendly when we have the ability to cement. And the strength allows for us to keep our preps really conservative. And now because it's a high strength, we are not running into worrying that if our prep is more conservative that we're gonna see more chipping. So one of the key things in order to take advantage of that four and a half minute firing is you wanna go ahead and remember in the speed fire to preheat the oven. So you'll see this little button in the slide shown here. And now you wanna activate that. And now that you wanna do, the best time to do it is when we're milling because it takes about a minute for it to heat up. And if we do it too soon, it only lasts about a half hour. So you wanna to try to gauge it have your assistant go ahead and do the heating process, the preheating while we're milling our restoration. So this is what it will look like once we activate it. So now it will, this little thermometer tab is gonna glow orange. That means you've successfully uh, started the preheating process. And if you do forget to do it, it's, you're gonna lose time. It's gonna take about nine to 10 minutes instead of the four and a half. So with Tessera, these are our current um, shade translucencies and options. We currently have a high translucency and a medium translucency. Now for the high translucency, you're gonna see that we have um, just A2 and A3 HT shades currently. So where we're gonna use our high translucency is really basically when we're looking to replace enamel. So um, in cases that are, are onlays and things that we're not really replacing enamel and dentin, we're gonna take advantage of the high translucency so you can get the dentin as a substrate influence your final shade. So you can still use it on all the applications, inlays, onlays, veneers, and partial and full coverage. And then our medium translucency, now we have a lot of options with the shades. We have the A1 to A3 and a half, you have B1, you have C1, D2, and we also do have one LT shade that's a BL2. Um, again, for the medium translucency, that's going to be my go-to for replacement of dentin and enamel restorations. 
and inlays, onlays, you know, veneers, partial and full coverage will apply. So let's just take a quick look at some of the current limitations. So the shades that we currently have, we don't have a all of the shades in the Vita Shade Guide at this point in time. So we have some limited limitations with the shades and translucencies. Uh, it's really important that we know that you must glaze and matrix fire for it to actually achieve its ideal strength. So it's not elective. You wanna make sure that you are firing this material. Um, because it is already being uh, grinded in its final state, it's harder on the milling burrs. So it's a harder material. So we might notice that we might have to replace our burrs more frequently. Now, currently we don't have the option to do fast grinding, but that could absolutely change in the future. So then that, you know, we'll see how that goes, but right now we don't have that option. Uh, you also need to use either 5.1.1 uh, chair side software or higher. So it's not available for older versions. And currently we don't have any bridge uh, blocks available. The only size that we have is the size 14 block. So I wanted to share with you an x-ray. Uh, this is an x-ray of one of my cases. And um, just for comparison's sake, I wanted to show the radial opacity of Tessera. So on the lower left molar tooth number 19, that is a Tessera crown. And if you want to compare the radial opacity to zirconia in this slide, the upper left first molar number 14, that is zirconia. So you can see um, that what's nice about Tessera is it's not as radio opaque as zirconia. And I'd say it's a little more opaque than some of our other glass ceramics like Emacs. So I would say if zirconia and Emacs had a baby, they would have Tessera. So that's kind of where it is. It's in the middle. I, I'm happy with the radio opacity on this material because I can see clearly the margins. I can see my cement line. Um, and it's easy to read the shape and size of the prep. So I find it very advantageous. So let's take a look at the preparation guidelines for Tessera. Now we have um, for the prep guidelines, if we're going to do adhesive bonding, then for both our anterior and posterior full coverage crowns, we're gonna to want to have a minimal thickness of one millimeter all the way around. So our occlusal and our reductions for our facial lingual, buccal lingual, you're going to need a minimal thickness of one millimeter if we're gonna be bonding. And now for our um, inlays, we're gonna look at also one millimeter minimal thickness for our width and depth. For our onlays partial coverage, you want one and a half millimeters on your cuspal reduction. And now for veneers, we're gonna have a 0.4 uh, reduction minimal thickness in our cervical third, 0.6 in the mid facial, and our incisal reduction is gonna be between one and one and a half millimeters. Now, when we're going to bond to Sarah, we have to prepare the intaglio of the restoration. It does need to be etched with porcelain hydrofluoric etch. You're going to do that for 30 seconds, rinse, you're going to air dry, and then our silane is applied. And then you can proceed with ever bonded cement uh, material that you prefer and just follow your manufacturer's directions for the remaining of the process. Now for restorations that we plan to cement. So for the minimal thickness for conventional cementation, we need a minimal thickness now of one and a half millimeters as opposed to one millimeter for the adhesive bonded ones. And we really also have to recall that when we're doing conventional cementation, we need our preps to have mechanical retention and they need to have a taper between four to eight degrees and at least a four millimeter coronal height. And as always, we want our internal line angles rounded. So for our conventional cementation of a crown, 
there are two parameters that we have to be conscientious of that we want to change in our local parameter screen when we're designing our cases. So it's important to know with Tessera, the locked parameters are the manufacturer's recommended parameters for adhesive cementation. So we need to go into our local parameters and we're gonna change a couple of the parameters if we are planning on doing a conventional cemented restoration to get to the one and a half minimal thickness that we need. So let me show you how we do that. So if we're designing a case that we're going to plan to do a conventional cementation, the first thing, as soon as our proposal, our initial proposal is uh, appears on the screen, before we do any edits and changes, we're gonna go ahead and go into the local restoration parameters tab. So here we are in the initial screen, and I'm going to then proceed to the, on the bottom left, you see the restoration parameters tab. And then that's gonna bring us to our local parameters screen. And here you're gonna see all of the factory or manufacturer settings for whatever material that we're using. So for Tessera, you'll see the, the uh, local parameters up top. You're gonna to scroll over to the bottom as to the next screen, and that's gonna show us our locked parameters. So now if we continue to scroll from this screen, now you'll see that we have the locked parameters and we can just simply click to unlock. And now we're gonna change that. So right now it's gonna default for Tessera to 1000. And now we're gonna change that to 1500 micrometers, which is same as 1.5 millimeter thickness. And we're looking to change it for both the, uh, the margin, the minimal thickness occlusal and the minimal thickness radial. So right here, you'll see I'm changing it on the radial. And now right below it, you're gonna just change that for the occlusal. So now both are set to 1500. And now we can proceed by just selecting okay. And this will bring us right back to our edit restoration tab. And you know, you'll see the effect of the change of the parameters on the proposal. Now we're seeing the minimal thickness bubbles, we're seeing more surface area because it's the same proposal that was initially given for a one millimeter thickness occlusal radial. Now that same proposal is gonna have areas that are not one and a half. So the next thing we're gonna do is hit the recalculate tab which is highlighted here. And now once we recalculate the proposal, we're getting a new proposal that's considering those two local parameter changes. So now you'll see much less minimal thickness area to edit. So from here, it's simply, now you could do your editing process as we normally do. So simply take your favorite shape tool, the shape circular tool or anatomical tool, and you can just do the, or the form plus minus, and just simply go ahead and get rid of your minimal thickness, anything that's residually um, left over, and then go ahead and proceed as usual from there. So that's just something to keep in mind um, because if you're uh, not used to the routine and you wanna do conventional cementation, you don't want to forget and get into the screen where you do all these edits and then realize you forgot to change these two local parameters and have to um, repropose and redesign. So next I wanna to talk to you about grinding to Sarah. So I happen to have two MCXLs in my practice. I also have a prime mill. So on my MCXLs, I have the ability now to do fine grinding um, with the MCXL. So what I did was I went ahead and I just um, grinded a restoration and I wanted to do it in both my MCXL and the same restoration um, in the prime mill. So this was the first grinded molar I did. It was an MCXL fine grinding, and that came out, so I timed it, and it came out to 16, a uh, little over 16 minutes. And then I took a couple different images uh, to show you different angles of how the anatomy of that restoration looks like out of the MCXL. And now with the prime mill, we have options for grinding to Sarah 
we can either grind it in fine mode or extra fine. So extra fine, what extra fine, these are the tools in the prime mill for extra fine grinding of all the glass ceramics. Um, basically what you're looking to see here is that we have added these two additional smaller diameter diamond tools and it's the diamond, the 1.0 and the 0.6. And what they're doing is they're going to enhance and give us the extra fine details in our occlusal anatomy with the smaller diameter. So we would install all four of these in the prime mill to proceed with the grind extra fine option. Now, this is what the screen looks like in the prime mill. If you're not familiar, you're gonna go into the menu and just select grind extra fine. And now here is what the uh, main screen is gonna look like once those tools are installed. And now again, if we need to go into this screen, this is how we would change a specific tool or all of the tools as needed. I wanted to mention if you're not familiar with the Prime Mill, uh, we have the ability now, each tool has an RFID reader on the back end. And now what that allows us to do is every time we're using this tool, it's going to register how many uses and it will give us a countdown of percentage of life. So the recommended time to replace our tools is when they have less than 30% life left. Now I'll tell you that some doctors online have pushed the envelope and they report then they, you know, that they're going down to 0%. Um, so you might on occasion get away with these things, but I really want to recommend it. When, um, when the tool is less than 30%, if we keep using it, you're going to run the risk that the tool could break. And it also is going to take potentially longer for it to actually finish grinding the restoration because it's, it's dull. The, for me, the, the last thing that I want to have happen is an interrupted uh, mill for a broken tool change when I happen to have walked away and I'm in the middle of a hygiene exam. And by the time either my team member or I discover that it has not uh, continued and it's been interrupted, now I have to first change the tools. And this can be very um, undesirable and throw me off schedule. So for me, I don't need to test how far I can go. I'd rather just change it and make sure that I continually be efficient. So now we have the extra fine uh, restoration that I did in the prime mill and I timed it. And now that took a little over 27 minutes. So side by side, you can see here in this image that there is a significant difference. If you look, you can see the extra fine, you are getting a lot more occlusal anatomy from those extra fine tools. What you have to decide now is when you want to employ it, because I would say for a single visit molar it depends on the uh, demands of the case and the type of restoration we're creating, we might find that for the extra 10 minutes to even or even longer for the extra fine grinding, in a two hour visit, it may not be efficient and we may not elect to use it. But where it can become uh, desirable is when we're doing our anterior cases, our case that we're going to want more anatomy or veneers. So it's really nice to have options. So it's nice that we have both ways of grinding. As far as finishing to Sarah, the next step is we're going to, after we grind the restoration, um, usual and customary, we're going to remove the sprue with a diamond impregnated stone. It's going to be at a low RPM. And then we always uh, steam clean the restoration. And now we have to move on to our glazing because we do have to glaze and fire to Sarah for it to achieve its optimal strength. So for the glazing, so you can fire to Sarah in a conventional oven, but it is optimized to work with the Ceric speed fire. So again, the key is also remembering to preheat that oven to reduce the uh, firing time. 
So preheat it to get that four and a half minute cycle. Now you can either spray glaze or you can elect to paint on stain and glaze. You don't have to stain, but you do have to glaze. And again, we have to put glaze and fire to get that optimal strength. And now um, Densply Serona recommends you either use the Indenco or DS Universal Spray Glaze if you're going to choose to spray. And if you're going to do the paint on, uh, you're gonna to want to use the DS Universal Stain and Glaze uh, materials, that's what's recommended. So now the next thing after we have steam cleaned our restoration, we're gonna now start the process to apply our glaze. So the first thing we wanna do is we're gonna be placing it on this silicone, moldable silicone putty. That's what we're gonna be using to hold the restoration. Um, it's really important to note that you don't use any firing putty or paste with this material. So once we have it onto the moldable silicone, next we're gonna go ahead and then we're going to use the, um, if we're doing the spray glaze technique, you're going to spray and apply the spray glaze. You can do a couple coats and uniformly apply it. And once we've finished applying the spray glaze, now if we want to, we need to transfer it to the special honeycomb firing pad. Um, and when we go to do that, we're gonna just use ceramic tweezers and just grab the restoration on the interproximal to tease it off. So with the spray glazing, the spray glazing is going to make it look frosty before we fire it. So you can see in the photo here, after the spray glaze was applied, it has this white frosty appearance. Now you can only fire one crown at a time on that fast setting in the speed fire. And there's a specific honeycomb tray and firing pad that you're using specifically to fire to Sarah. So it's shown in this photo, you see the small honeycomb tray, and then on top of it is the specific firing pad. And you need both, or you can elect to use specific dense ply Serona investment pins. And if you're gonna choose that option, then there, you don't use any firing putty or paste just the DES support pins, and that goes right on the wedding cake. You eliminate the firing uh, honeycomb tray and pad for that option. You want to make sure that you're going to place in the center to um, expose it to the correct temperature. Now, for firing it, you always want to place it with the intaglio side down. If it's a bicuspid, you can lean it on, its, on the interproximal and the anteriors are gonna go with the lingual side down. And again, no putty, no paste. So for spray glazing, this is what it looks like um, right after we've applied the spray. So again, you'll see it has a different appearance. It has this frosty look to it. And now right after we're done firing, this is what it's gonna look like just with the spray glaze coat applied. And this is when it right comes out of the furnace. So another option that we have instead of the spray glaze is we can do the paint on stain and glaze. So this is a picture of the Densply Serona Universal Stain and Overglaze Kit, and it has a lot of options. So you can see there's um, all of your different colors and you have your incisal stains and you have your body stains. So it's a very comprehensive kit. So pictured here, these are my go-to. So I have a recipe that I use from whatever system I'm using, the comparable colors from that specific system. And I'll use the same pattern for majority of my cases. And it keeps me on schedule, it keeps me efficient, and it also um, keeps me from do, getting a similar result time and time again. So what you'll see here is I'm always gonna pull out a um, the mahogany, and the incisal 
And then I'm going to choose a body shade that is the body shade appropriate for the shade value of the restoration that I've chosen to create. And then um, a white or a cream. And then there's with this system, you have two glazes. You have a overglaze, the universal overglaze and a high fluorescence. And then you're going to see that there's also the stain and glaze liquid that we're going to use as well. So this is what my um, pattern normally looks like. So you'll see here that I will apply. I do like to stain and glaze my cases. Um, I don't, not trying to, when I'm doing this staining technique, I will say that I'm not doing it because I want the tooth to look um, dirty or anything. I'm not putting staining in the occlusal so that it looks like the patient has decay. The, the goal of this is to give it more life, to make it look more uh, lifelike and more natural because with the different tints, we're able to change the way the light hits this material. So while it's monolithic, we're trying to give the illusion that it's polychromatic. So if you look here, I will put a darker color into the depths of the fissures like mahogany, and that is going to again, draw it down and try to make it look like there's more detail of that occlusal anatomy and more depth. And then I will apply a white on areas that there's a natural highlight on a natural tooth. So that would be on the lobes or the marginal ridges, and sometimes also a little bit on the cusp or the incisal edges. And then um, an incisal blue or an incisal tint, that's giving the illusion that it's enamel has translucency and we're trying to give the illusion that this is natural enamel. So by putting a little blue there, it gives the optical illusion that it's more translucent. So let me show you my technique on how I apply. So again, now we're looking at the restoration is, has, has been steam cleaned and now it's mounted onto the silicone putty. And now I'm going to first take the glaze liquid and I'm just applying a thin coat over the entire surface of the restoration. So you can see in this picture, I've already just applied it on the left-hand side. So you can see the right is still dry. And I'm gonna put a thin coat. I don't want it to pull. So I will take any extra excess that's pulling in the occlusal surface. And I'm gonna pull it out with the brush so I get anything uh, that's pulling away. And then I want a nice thin coat. And this is just gonna help me apply the glaze in a more smooth, consistent application. So the next thing I do is I'm gonna have my yeah, universal glaze. I'm gonna apply the glaze on the whole surface of the restoration. And with the glaze, you want it to be like a nice honey consistency. So you can see as I'm pulling it up in the brush, that's the type of consistency we're looking for. So now I will go ahead and I'm going to, usually I start on the occlusal surface and I start from the central fossa and I'm working my way out towards the cusp tips. And then I will proceed with applying it on the buckle, work to the mesial, to the lingual, to the distal and coat the entire restoration. So next, now I will apply the mahogany. So you'll see here, I'm putting it into the fissures and the fossa. And I'm just, again, I don't want it to look too heavy. I just want to give it that illusion that there's natural fissures and depth to the restoration. So I'm gonna work it into the grooves and then I will, any pooling or any excess, I will also remove so that it's not too heavy. So next, I'm going to apply the blue to the cusp tips, and again, to give that illusion that it's more translucent. Now, the, a good tip when I'm applying the blue is how much do we apply? So I don't want it to look blue. So you don't want to be too heavy handed with this. A great litmus test is if you wear loops, if you're applying all your stainless glaze with loops on, then you should see the blue with your loops. But if you remove your loops, you shouldn't be able to actually see the blue. That's how you know you did the right quantity and it's not too heavy. 
So now um, applying the white and you can see that's going on to the lobes. And again, you'll start to see that it's starting to come to life. It's starting to look much more polychromatic. And now we're gonna to proceed to the cervical warmth. I like to apply the cervical third of the restoration, the body stain. And now with this, again, don't, you don't wanna to be too heavy handed and you want it to blend. So you don't wanna see where it starts and ends. You don't want a line. So you're gonna do more of like a dabbing motion to try to blend this into your restoration. And just like we did previously with the, stain, uh, the spray glaze, now I'm going to transfer it with the ceramic tweezers um, from the, the molded silicone putty. And now we're gonna place it onto the special honeycomb tray and firing pad. And that's what it looks like bef uh, right before it gets fired. So I just wanted to also show you the alternative is to use these DS investment pins that are specific for Tessera. So this is what it looks like if we're, we're not using the um, special honeycomb firing pad. And here you'll see that it just goes on the pin, no putty, no pastes, and we're going right onto the wedding cake of the firing. And where sometimes I find this could become helpful using the firing pin is on a bicuspid or if it's a, a prep that doesn't have a deep intaglio and it's leaning, this, if you did a lot of paint and stain and glaze, it will still stand up on the pin as opposed to having to place it onto the interproximal on the firing pad. So I also like to um, polish after I have whether I'm doing a spray glaze or paint on stain and glaze after it's fired, I like to use a chamois bohair brush on a low RPM in my lamp hand piece and I find this gets a really nice high gloss. So this is the side-by-side -side comparison, same restoration um, that you can see on the left-hand side, that was the spray glaze versus the paint on stain and glaze. So for me, I happen to prefer the paint on stain and glaze. I don't find it um, because I do it routinely. It's not more time consuming for me. And I really find that a little bit goes a long way and I just think it looks more uh, lifelike. And then I wanted to see how it compares as far as the uh, restoration. Both of these were A2MT. And now I'm showing you versus the shade tab. And I really am impressed because it really does match really well. So if you look at the A2 shade tab of the final restoration versus um, the, uh, the actual tab, you'll see that it's really spot on. So let's take a look at a few clinical cases with uh, to Sarah. So this patient, she needed a full coverage crown, was treatment planned on number 14 on her upper left first molar. She had a history of wear and a significantly worn, large failing composite resin restoration. It had basically uh, wrapped completely on to the distal buccal cusp and wall, and there was some recurrent decay. So you could see here that there's, that's the occlusal view and also the buccal view. And you can see how much loss of that distal buccal cusp from the composite wearing over time. So we went ahead and this was the preparation. We prepared it for a full coverage crown after and also completed out all the carries and did a new buildup on the tube. And these are the burrs that I generally use for my posterior preparation. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, I am using... On the left, you'll see it's a Meisinger 2.0 occlusal reduction diamond burr. And that's where I'm doing my initial occlusal reduction. And then I will do my margins with its uh, Brassler, a chamfer green stripe 6856018. And then I will go and refine my margins and smooth with a 8856018 finishing chamfer. 
Um, I also like to use the picture here that's the second from the right. That is a uh, Brashler diamond barrel burr for our anatomic occlusal reduction. And then I have um, a football finishing diamond burr, and that's what I'm going to be using to gent round and smooth the transitions from my occlusal and axial walls. So let's take a look at this case. So I went ahead and we took our acquisition and I will mention that I am a fan of scanning full arch. At uh, the bare minimum, you, to get the best proposals, you do wanna scan if it's a single restoration you're fabricating, you wanna scan to the contralateral canine to get the best proposals. Um, but for me, I find there's a lot of advantages from doing full arch scans. I don't find it time consuming and I like having a digital library and a digital record of the patient's uh, teeth. So where it comes in handy is in the event that same patient that you did a molar restoration on, let's say that now they had an uh, accident and they broke their front central incisor. Now we have a reference. We can go back and use and biocopy their initial tooth and actually give them a replica of what they once had. So that's a great opportunity. I also like it just for seeing a patient's transition, change in their dentition and charting over time. So we can see people with bite collapse or patients didn't agree to treatment and you're seeing how they progress and how fast things are changing. So it's good for comparison sake. Um, and it's just, there's, there's a lot of things we can use these records for. If a patient's doing a full mouth rehab, and you're doing a section at a time, you have the opportunity to build on these scans and use them and cut and paste them into future files. So I go ahead and scan her. And now once I have the scan, I will check this, the model access step. Uh, with the latest software, the AI is really, uh, has improved significantly. And we're finding that the auto margin feature is uh, very close and, is significantly better than it has been in the past, but I still find I'll do a little tweak on these uh, steps. So I will check it because if I can correct it a little bit here, I'll have less editing to do on my design. So now we're like at the stage where I'm drawing the margin. So the margin is completely drawn. And now from there, we go to the set insertion access. We can confirm that's where we want. And now to the design. So after I've now completed the design, I'm happy with the anatomy. I've checked the embrasures. I look at it from the different aspects. Now we're, I'm ready to go ahead and grind the final restoration. So I wanted to show you what the manufacturer screen looks like for the different mills. So for this is the screen, if I was grinding this restoration in my MCXL. So you wanna see here that um, you're going to see here that the only option that you can select is fine. So my MCXL extra fine is because it only has two motors. It's not an option and there's no fast option currently. So the by default, you're going to select fine if you're grinding it in an MCXL. That's uh, a wet MCXL with two motors. And now when I go to the prime mill, now you'll see that I have, I can choose between fine or extra fine. So that's the main difference here is now there's an, an alternative grinding mode in the prime mill that's available. So this is that case. And now I did go ahead and create two of them. And one I did with the fine grinding in my MCXL and that one I finished just by spray glazing. And then the other restoration I did, I decided to do that extra fine on the prime mill for comparison sake. And then I did stain and glaze that one with the paint line stain and glaze. And I timed it and you could see that it took me a little like, over 21 minutes for the spray glaze and fine grind. And then on the uh, extra fine and paint on, that took me almost 35 minutes. So but you can see it was a significant difference.
So I ended up uh, delivering the paint on stain and glaze. And I, like I said earlier, that's usually my preference because I like to have all of my cases look as lifelike as possible. So there is the Tessera after it's been delivered and that's the occlusal view and the buckle view. Um, again, it was an A2MT. So I was very pleased with the results. Here's another case. Um, so this patient happens to actually be an endodontist. And, you know, unfortunately, he's so busy treating his own patients that he's probably the last to get into the chair. So he ended up, um, he knew he needed these teeth restored. And then, of course, he lost the uh, distal lingual cusp on the second molar. And it was pretty nice fracture and went subgingival. So we went ahead to restore both of these teeth with full coverage crowns. Now, um, here it is after we removed the old amalgams and excavated, and we also did some crown lengthening. And now we're here to finish. And you'll see I had just um, was getting rid of any of the remaining caries underneath those restorations. And now after new buildups and final preps, I was ready to um, design this case and same as previous, same steps were followed. And here I created two um, restorations and both were to Sarah. And we, again, I used the A2MT for this case as well. And this was at the time of insertion. So again, paint on stain and glaze for this case. Um, I did do the fine grinding. I did not do the extra fine um, for both were done with fine grinding. And I was very happy again with the fit and the marginal integrity and the overall lifelike appearance of the restorations. And I felt confident doing this on a second molar because the high strength that Tessera has now, it's comparable to a lot of our translucent zirconias so for second molars, where we usually go for high strength, I think this is a great option now that we can employ for second molars as well um, and still have the aesthetics of the glass. So here um, again is the occlusal view and now that is from the buckle view, um, slight buckle. And in occlusion, and again, I just, think that they look really lifelike. And here's just another quick uh, example of another case I did. This was an A3 to Sarah um, MT uh, to show you that it is really also does look really um, aesthetic even when we're using it for more uh, bicuspids or anterior cases. And this case, so it was, uh, Again, number 29 was the restoration. And I actually shared this case um, on social media and had asked if anyone could guess the material, which material was used. And majority guessed other blocks, blocks that have been out for many, many years and that are well known for their high aesthetics. So for me, that just confirmed that to Sarah is a great new addition to our CAD CAM blocks and it's here to stay. It's really beautiful, looks very natural against the adjacent dentition. So if you haven't had the opportunity to check it out yet, I definitely recommend you give it a try. So this concludes uh, the presentation and thank you again for joining me. And please um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Halpern, for sharing your knowledge and insights on the Sarek to Sarah block. And of course, thank you to Dental Supply Serona for sponsoring this webinar. Everyone in attendance tonight will receive the recording via email sometime in the next week. And lastly, if anyone is interested in attending future Henry Shine webinars, visit henryshinedental.com webinars for our upcoming schedule. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great night.